Lord, we thank you so much for your presence here this morning. And we thank you that we can assemble ourselves together this morning in freedom and in peace. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to be here. Great to be up here again. Great to be back. Listen, the founding father, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, Benjamin Franklin, said that in this life, there is nothing that can be certain except for two things. I heard somebody. Death and taxes. But I want to tell you something else that is certain in this life. Discouragement. If you haven't already experienced it, you will. It doesn't matter how old you are, you will. And the important thing to remember with discouragement is to be true to yourself and honest before the Lord with how you feel and the reality of the things that you experience. Discouragement in this life is inevitable. The Word of God tells us clearly that in this life we will and can expect to experience difficulties, hardships, tribulations, all of which can be used by Satan to entice us and lead us into a place of discouragement. You know, we all get discouraged from time to time. And I'm sure this last year has been filled with discouragements for each of us. Whether it be the pandemic that's got you down, whether it be work that has you down, maybe you don't have work, and that's discouraged you. Maybe you've experienced the loss of a loved one. Maybe your snowblower's not working. Maybe your neighbors are building a giant renovation beside your house and it's going to be very loud and invasive. Maybe you've been waiting on the Lord for a fulfilled promise and haven't yet seen it. Maybe you're still waiting for healing. Maybe you're still waiting for a word from the Lord. Whatever it is that's causing you discouragement, Remember that the enemy is desperately trying to lure us away from God's presence and fellowship with other people. The Bible is filled with stories about individuals who must have been discouraged. And it shows us their journey and what that looked like for each of them. Let's take a look at Adam. There's no way he wasn't discouraged. He was living in paradise. He had it as good as he gets. Him and his wife made a major mistake, and guess what? It threw the whole operation under the bus, and next thing you know, they're out the door. Thorns, thistles, dry ground, hard work, sweat on the brow, pain and labor. That is not my idea of a day at the park. There's no way they weren't discouraged. You know, they didn't leave the garden saying, oh, this is going to be fine. We're just going to trust the Lord and it's all going to work out. I can tell you what they said. In non-explicit terms, they said, this sucks. We liked it better in the garden. We liked it better in paradise. We're not ready for this. Noah. Noah was told to build a boat. A really big boat on dry land. He didn't have a labor force under his thumb to direct and to command either. What he was asked to build was monumental. Not only that, he was asked to build it on dry ground in the middle of nowhere. And it wasn't a task that would take him three or four years. It took him a very, very, very long time, and there's no way he wasn't discouraged, because guess what? He didn't have a bunch of happy campers on his left and his right saying, you can do it, Noah. We're behind you. He had a bunch of people laughing and jeering at him. 
mocking him, saying, what is this guy doing and what does he think he's getting himself ready for? There's no way he wasn't discouraged. Abraham, Abraham was promised a son and a lineage. Nope, not happening. I guess I better take matters into my own hands. Why? Because he was discouraged. He didn't see what he believed God had promised to him. Moses. Moses was handed a massive ministry. And then he realized, well, this is way bigger than I can do. I'm not ready for this. I can't handle this. He had to actually find a stand-in because he was so discouraged about his own inadequacies. And furthermore, once he actually began the journey and the Israelites began leaving Egypt, he was told that he was going to have a land with milk and honey, good things, promises. Then why am I walking around in the wilderness with this obstinate people who saw all of the amazing things that you did and yet still continue to plain and grumble? Are you kidding me? Come on, Lord, what's the deal? There's no way he wasn't discouraged. Can I get an amen? Woo! You think you got problems. He's wandering around in the wilderness with two million people without food and water on certain days, trusting the Lord day by day for the provision and saying, man, if you don't come through, we are all in big trouble, Lord. And there was instances, wasn't there, where the Lord said, trust me, I will deliver you. Trust me, I will provide for you. And Moses said at one point, okay, where is the water? You want water? I'll show you water. And his discouragement smashes the rock. And God says, no, no, that's not how we do things. You are missing the mark. He was enticed into this place of discouragement. He was discouraged. When he came down from the mountain with the, ta with the uh, tablets, with the law, he didn't see a bunch of happy people rejoicing in God's faithfulness. He's like, are you kidding me? Again. There's no way he wasn't discouraged. David, a man after God's heart who saw God so faithfully give him victory on the battlefield, gave him political, military, and spiritual victory. And how does his life pan out halfway through? His family, his kingdom in ruins, in shambles, squabbling, infighting, all kinds of problems. He lost his son because of his sin. We see a man in sackcloth and ashes. That's not a man who's saying, well, praise the Lord, we're going to get through this. He was broken. He was discouraged. Nehemiah. First of all, if it wasn't discouraging enough that they were in Babylon, because they all got exiled and deported, he ends up finding a nice job there. But it's not enough, you see. He says, I, I see the brokenness of my people back home, and I want to go to them and help them. So the word of the Lord comes to him. He's encouraged. He gets there. He's got a plan. He's got a vision. He's got an agenda. And as he begins to help the people rebuild the walls, to protect Jerusalem, what happens? All of the neighboring tribes and communities coming against them, discouraging them. You're never going to build your wall. Your walls are garbage. Even if a fox was to run on them, they'd come to the ground toppling down. Discouragement. Nehemiah definitely felt it. Paul. How about Paul. I mean, most of his life and ministry was in jail, being beaten, tortured because of his faith in Christ. At one point, he says, you know, God, I just wish I could serve you without this thorn in the flesh. This thing is really getting me down. Why can't I have the freedom and the peace and the, the healing that I've been offering and praying for others? Why am I stuck with this thing? 
God says, there's a reason. There's a purpose behind that thorn that I've given to you. But he was discouraged. He must have been. But praise the Lord that none of these heroes of the faith ever gave up. And that's why their names and stories have been recorded for us, so that we might not only learn from their examples, but be encouraged by their examples of faith and perseverance. So what happened? All of these individuals had a deep relationship with God. They all understood his promises and his expectations. And if they, being who they are, struggled and were discouraged. What hope do we have? Well, we have an abiding hope, don't we? We have one who is with us, who understands what we go through, who feels what we feel, who knows what we know, who sees what we see, and is there attending to our every need. So what is discouragement anyways? Well, boiled down simply, discouragement is the state of having lost one's confidence, enthusiasm, or motivation. I'll say that again. It's when we lose or have lost our confidence, lost our enthusiasm, or motivation. And spiritually speaking, this can be a very, very dangerous place for us. Discouragement is like a dark cloud that covers our lives, inhibiting us from seeing the beauty and the presence of the Lord all around us. It causes us to be self-focused. It leads us to wallow in our own self-pity, making claims that life is unfair, while drawing attention to others of how hard done by we are. Anybody been there? Eventually, this self-focus will lead us into even darker places of despair, such as depression, anxiety, and a host of other mental health issues. Discouragement, when left unchecked, will chip away at and begin to erode our faith, undermining our hope and extinguishing our love for Christ and for one another. Discouragement is a dangerous, dangerous trap. It has the power to entice us away from God's presence, robbing us of joy and peace, patience, our kindness, tenderness, goodness, gentleness. But you know what? Our enemy, Satan, would love nothing more than to see our fruit spoiled, wouldn't he? Should this surprise us? No, the Bible says we're not ignorant of his schemes. We know that Satan comes to do three primary things. Tell me what it is. To steal, to kill, and destroy. This is his objective. To steal, kill, and destroy. But you know what? God wants us to be confident. Confident in his faithfulness. Confident in the work of grace. His work of grace in our lives. He wants us to have a rich enthusiasm. For what? For the kingdom of God. Did you catch that? Discouragement is the absence of confidence. It's the absence of enthusiasm, motivation. But God says, I want you to be confident in me. And that's where where Satan goes to work. What he's really eroding at, what he's really chipping away at, is our confidence in God's faithfulness to see us through the dilemmas that we face. He's trying to rob us of our enthusiasm for the kingdom of God. He's trying to rob us of our motivation to see the kingdom of God released all around us. He's trying desperately to inhibit us from doing the work that God has given each of us to do. 
So where does discouragement come from? And I do apologize that this isn't all up here, but guess what? A free gift to you. If you go to the website, when you go to check out the message, if you want to, the notes will be posted there this week, okay? All, this, all the scriptures and the ideas and the, and the things that I'm bringing up, it's all going to be posted right there if you want to take a look at it. So if you're feeling like, I wish I had something to follow and to look at, just be patient, and th- we thank you so much for your patience with us, okay? And by the way, I forgot to mention, for those of you at home who are enjoying the service at home live, God bless you. We are so glad that you are with us as well. All right, so where does discouragement come from? Well, discouragement comes from a few primary areas, I think. Number one, discouragement comes from false expectations. Discouragement comes from failure. Discouragement comes from frustration. Discouragement comes when we begin to compare ourselves to others, making social comparisons which lead us to envy and to become jealous of the things we don't have that we see others having. Often discouragement comes when people treat us poorly, but that's part of that expectations, isn't it? We have false expectations. Sometimes we think that everybody should treat us a certain way. And when we don't get that response, when we don't get that coming in, we feel discouraged. And of course, El Diablo. The devil is in no short supply of tools and tactics to do everything he can to discourage us and pull us away from the presence of God. Often discouragement surfaces because we want something that we cannot have or that hasn't yet been given to us. Don't forget that. That's very important. I know no one takes notes anymore in church, but listen, again, they'll be posted for you, but that's a really critical point for people to remember. It comes because we want something, and I'm not getting what I want. The selfishness, right? That's spoiled. Rather than trusting the Lord to give us what we need when we need it, I want something, I'm not getting it, so I'm frustrated. Interesting scripture, James chapter 4, addresses this. He says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have because you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what gives you pleasure. You see, what we really want, are you ready for this? What we really want is problem-free living. What we really want is a life without problems. We want a life without trials, a life without obstacles, a life without hardships. Don't we all want that? Come on, nobody goes through life saying, I wish I had some more trials. More obstacles, Lord. Nobody wants these things. In fact, if we're honest with ourselves, we can actually be subtly and discreetly manipulative to do everything in in our power to avoid having come in contact with those obstacles and trials. It's in our very nature. It's in our very DNA to avoid pain, to avoid uncomfortable situations. We hate confrontation generally. Is this true? We do everything we can to circumvent the trials and the obstacles and the pain and the trials. But the Bible says that the Christian life is marked by these realities and that they're the very gate by which we enter into heaven. But it's not these trials that mark our way to heaven. It's our response to those trials that builds up and establishes a reward for us in heaven. Psalm 100 says, 
Know that the Lord is good, and it is he who made us. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I said that was the gate, didn't I, into heaven? It's not the trial. It's our response to the trial. So when trials and obstacles and difficulties and hardships come our way, thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to trust you and to grow in you. Isn't this what James chapter 1 says? He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And he says, allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God wants us to be encouraged this morning. And here are a few things that encourage me. I am very encouraged that Jesus Christ is building his church today. That he, the work he began 2,000 years ago still continues today. And it still continues to advance in power. And its, and its effectiveness is, is ramping up. He is on the move. He is building his church. And he is preparing us for what is coming next. He has been doing this for 2,000 years and he hasn't stopped. That encourages me. It encourages me to know that he is still and will always be on his throne. And no matter what my problems, no matter what my obstacles, no matter what my trials, he is on his throne. He got this. He knows what I'm going through. And he will not let me down. That's encouraging. I'm very encouraged that this church is still alive and thriving. I'm encouraged that, it, that in two and a half minutes, all the seats were gobbled up for the service this morning. That's encouraging. It's discouraging if you didn't get a seat, but it's encouraging to watch that there is a desire, there is a need, there is a hunger in God's people to fellowship and to come together to praise him, to worship him, and to hear his name glorified. That's encouraging. I'm encouraged that we have a plan, that there's good things in store in this church for the next one, two, and three years. I don't know what they are. I know what some of them are, and it's encouraging. I'm encouraged that we're in a church where people are being trained and equipped to do the work of the kingdom. I'm encouraged that we today have accessible, tangible um, um, uh, awareness of the Word of God. Do you know we know more today than a lot of believers knew 1,500 years ago? Like we have a complete Bible, and you can go into most stores or thrift shops and pick one up. You couldn't do that 500 years ago. We have an incredible, accessible am amount of knowledge regarding all of God's promises. I'm encouraged by John chapter 16. Where Jesus says, an hour is coming and is already be that you will be scattered each to your own home. And you will leave me all alone, yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. And I have told you these things, that in me you might have peace. He says, in this world you will have tribulation, but take courage. For I have overcome the world. And I am with you, and I will be with you until the ends of the age. God wants us to be filled with hope and enthusiasm regarding his goodness and all of his promises. He wants us to be confident in him. He wants us to be confident in his faithfulness. He wants us to be confident in the truth of his promises. Let's read a couple promises right now. Psalm 34, if you have a Bible, oh, please, let me, see, let me hear paper. There's got to be somebody out there that has a paper Bible. Psalm 34, chapter uh, 34, verse 17 to 19 says, The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. 
He rescues them from all of their troubles. He is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person will face many troubles, but the Lord comes to his rescue every time. Do you know this is a promise that you can bank on? This is a promise that you can keep, that you can put your stakes down on. Psalm 55 says, cast your burden on him and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Learn from me, he says. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Check this out. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 12, We are pressed on every side by troubles. We are pressed on every side by troubles. But guess what he says? We are not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We're hunted down but never abandoned by God. We will get knocked down, but we will not be destroyed. Isaiah 43 says, When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go down through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Does this sound familiar? It should because it's a promise that's echoed down to us in the New Testament, Mark chapter 16, where he says, these miraculous signs will accompany those that believe. He says, they will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. They will drink poison and it won't hurt them. They will place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Is this not exactly what was written about in uh, Isaiah 43? It's the same thing. It's the same promise echoed down to us. So, our time is almost out. What can we do? to deal with this monster discouragement. I'm going to give you a couple of practical things to consider through the week. Are you ready? This is nothing new. This is nothing you haven't heard before. I just want to remind you. Number one, this week, give your attention by turning your heart to him and trusting the truth of his word. Philippians chapter 4 says... Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Guess what? His word is all of those things. Paul is saying in Philippians, let your mind dwell on the word. And the things you have learned and received and heard in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, I'm going to give you a a new word. Are you ready for this? This is vocabulary day. And the word is acquisitively. Say it now. Acquisitively. Okay, great. So I want you this week to acquisitively stake your claim on the promises of of God's word. Acquisitively means you take ownership of something, you possess something, you put your stakes down something, and you own something. God wants you to take ownership of his word this week. Appropriation. Acquisitively, stake your claim on his word. Number three, pray for wisdom. Ask God to give you revelation so that you might see what he sees. If you're discouraged and you don't know why, ask God to show you. Is it it failure? Is it, am I comparing myself to somebody? Is it a wrong expectation? Why is it that I feel so discouraged? Ask God. Remember James says, if, if you're lacking anything, ask him for wisdom. Ask him for revelation. Ask him to show you why you're discouraged. And trust him 
to give you what you need to sustain you in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your hardships, in the midst of your difficulties. Ask him for his heavenly perspective to see things as he does from the top down. And finally, be thankful. Be thankful. James says, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Be thankful in his faithfulness. Be thankful in his goodness. Be thankful that you have access to the riches of his word. Be thankful for the things that you have. Be content with what God has given to you so that you do not begin to compare yourself to others, to envy others, or become jealous of others. I'm going to give you one last scripture that we're going to read together as the worship team prepares to lead us in our final song. If you have a Bible, please open it up to Matthew chapter 14. Now listen, I feel like there is no better scripture to underpin this morning's message than this scripture. Are you with me? Matthew chapter 14. All right. We're going to read verse 22. Are you ready? This is some good stuff right here. You ready for this? All right. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. And while he sent the people home, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land. A strong wind had arisen, and they were fighting the waves. And about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them, walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once and said, Do not be afraid. Take courage, for I am here. And Peter called to him and said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking out on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over to the side of the boat and he began walking on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind and the waves, he was terrified, and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And they climbed back into the boat, and the wind stopped, and the disciples worshipped him, and they said, You really are the Son of God. You see, Peter was walking on the water and his eyes were on Jesus. The word says to fix our eyes upon him. The Bible says turn neither to the left or to the right. Look neither up nor down, but dead in front, right ahead of you, keeping your eyes fixed on him who is able him who is faithful, him who is mighty and powerful in spirit. But you see, as Peter began walking towards Jesus, he saw the obstacles, the trials, the waves. And his focus became more on the waves, the obstacles, the trials, the difficulties, the hardships. And as he began to turn his gaze from the Lord, to the peripheral, what happened? He became sank. Right? He began to sink. And he began to be overwhelmed by the water. But as soon as he turned his gaze back to the Lord again and reached out to him, the Lord was so faithful, not rebuking him, but grabbing him by the hand saying, Come, come here. Why did, you, why did you doubt me? Why 
Why did you not trust me? Don't you know, Peter, I love you? And the Lord says the same thing and will say the same thing to each of us as we go through our trials, our obstacles, and our hardships. Amen? Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for the promises of your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you are awesome. And this morning we declare that we have confidence in your faithfulness. We have confidence in your word. We are enthusiastic about the work that you're doing and the work that you are about to do. In Jesus' name, we love you and we thank you.